Dr. Tchaikovsky, former federal prosecutor, is with me on the Mez here in person. Great to see you. Uh, let's just start in Fort Pierce, Florida. Are we anticipating that the May trial date will move? Well, I, I'm most interested about the motion itself, and that's the challenge of the constitutionality of the application of the Espionage uh, Act to Donald Trump regarding these alleged classified documents. The law cannot be ambiguous in how it applies to certain people and under what conditions. So Donald Trump is making the argument now through his counsel that these charges are were never clear as to when the Classified Records Act or the, the Espionage Act would have been violated. It's all about this negotiation with the DOJ or with the, the archive uh, department. So that's what's most interesting. I think in terms of the trial date, certainly I think there's a good chance that it'll be August, but there's all sorts of ways the defense can still move that back, even if it gets set before the election now. So the six charges that were dropped yesterday were for non-specificity. I mean, is this a, is this a trend? Well, it certainly is uh, the exposure of what Donald Trump and his legal team have been saying all along, that there are critical flaws in the ability and the ways in which these prosecutors have come after the former president. And so what we see in Georgia is essentially the judge said that Fonnie Willis circularly defined his violation of, of the law. She didn't give specificity as to the acts which clearly were in violation of the law. And so they would have to recharge that now, which would cause a superseding mm -hmm. indictment and a, and a later trial date there as well. And that's even if Fonnie Willis remains on the case. But you have something, I, and I'm not you, but I'm, I'm hearing a similarity between what's going on with those drop charges that happened yesterday in Georgia and then what's going on with the espionage charges here. I mean, is it? Again, I'm not you, but I would think, you know, law school, year one, you learn how to write these things out so that the people can understand it and know what they're being accused of. Well, the problem is that we're prosecuting a former president. That's never been done in the history of He's still of our a country. person. He's still a person, and he retains many of the rights and privileges that, he, that were granted to him under the Constitution as ah. the executive. Mm -hmm. And that's what we get back to when we see it in the D.C. Uh, case right now where they're fighting immunity, because that's a very important issue. We have to have presidents who can operate independent of the risk of being prosecuted the day they're out of office. What's your opinion on whether the U.S. Supreme Court will jump in on this or if this will be further? Delayed. Well, I think they see the immunity issue as a as a prime issue, and I think that this is going to be a very important decision. The uh, the opinions on this are all over the place. Nobody has a good read on what the Supreme Court's going to do. But I believe that there's a very strong argument that we have to have an executive who has the ability to make decisions and not face the risk of prosecution the day they're out of office. And what does that do to because it's not just these two cases to even other cases if that happens? Well, the immunity case would. Uh, essentially kill anything that's out there right now, except for the New York criminal case. Uh, there could be arguments that it wouldn't apply to the, the classified records case, but mm -hmm. that the charge time frame in that case actually starts on the day he left office. So he was still the president oh, at one point in there. So that could even uh, affect those charges. Well, I, I haven't heard that talked about very much. Well, certainly not from the prosecutorial side. I guess that's why they want to get a date on the calendar in a hurry. Well, they're desperate for, for this <laughs> okay. to go because it's all political. I think that's the, the point here is that it looks like a political prosecution and they're exactly uh, doing what that would look like. You've done this for so long. Have you ever seen anything like it? Well, you see prosecutors push all the time. They're, they're advocates for their client and for the, the government, and that's an important role. But mm -hmm. when you have prosecutors that are engaging in political political prosecutions or ones that look very much like that, that's when the concern really comes in. And I have seen that. Uh, at any moment, we could get the judge's decision on whether to disqualify Fonnie Willis and her prosecutorial lover, Nathan Wade. They are facing a host of misconduct uh, accusations. And the judge so far has not really tipped his hand. Take a look. I gave myself a, a deadline because I knew everyone wanted an answer. And and I'll tell you, an order like this takes time to write. Uh, there's a lot that needs to, I have to go through. I'm calling it as best I can in the law as I, as I understand it. The judge that McAfee gave himself is, or excuse me, the deadline is tomorrow. And the case reverberating around 
and throughout that state. Yesterday, Governor Brian Kemp signed a bill to rein in, quote, rogue prosecutors. That's interesting timing as this is going on. Well, we have to remember what's going on in Georgia are politics. This is local politics at play, becoming the DA, becoming local judges. That's all very political. And so we have this little community in Georgia who's affecting the nation's politics. But when you look at what's going to happen uh, from the judge this week, we have to see that the only way he can essentially find to allow Fonnie Willis to stay on the case is to say that it doesn't matter what her credibility was in the courtroom or Nathan Wade's, and it doesn't matter if they had that relationship at a certain time and exchanged certain money. He has to say none of that matters and it doesn't affect the outcome of this trial. So I think she's on the path to disqualification. Does Nathan Wade go too? Oh, of course. I mean, if I think the, the question is, does he try to split the baby in the bathwater and, and have Nathan Wade disqualified but not her? I think that's a difficult case to make, though, because if it matters, it matters. The only, that's why I'm saying the only Look, way he could do this is if it doesn't matter. If she picked him and paid him the most, th those aren't ifs. We know that he made the most money out of all the prosecutors in the office, which is part of the conflict of interest uh, journey that we've all been following. That being the case, Look at the mess that those six charges showed us that, that got dropped yesterday. If he's the type of guy who's in charge, do you look at the entire case differently then? Well, I think if we... he gets left behind, say she goes, but he gets left, Nathan Wade. Th this is the exposure of the problem all along, is that, that, uh, that Trump has criticized the credibility of these prosecutions, and now we're seeing it come to fruition. You know, I, I keep hearing you say it, and, and I, I want to ask this. How dangerous is it to the profession that you love and that Americans need? We need a solid legal system in this country that treats everyone the same. How dangerous is letting politics get in like this with a political opponent going after another person? And, and you know that they are because look at at least this DA. You've got, you've got Letitia James here in New York. They use it as part of their political campaigns. Well, using the law and, and using jail as a threat to pursue your politics, that's a real problem. It's been a problem through the history of the world. And that's new in what is going on in politics right now. And I think it's unfortunate. I think it's dangerous to the executive. And I think that the presidency is a very important function of our country. And if, <laughs> if that is yeah. torn apart, then we have a problem. All right. President Trump is not the only one spending time in court this summer. Coming up, the president's son, Hunter Biden's gun charge trial, tentatively set for the week of June 3rd. And the judge who famously tore up his plea deal last year said that date now could slide because his tax charge trial is also later that month. When your trials collide. The judge's announcement came right after Hunter Biden declined an invitation from Congress to testify at a public hearing next week with former business associates Devin Archer and Tony Bobulinski. It's part of the House Republicans' impeachment investigation into President Biden. And Hunter's attorney called it an invitation to a carnival sideshow. Oversight Chairman James Comer with us. All I heard from Hunter Biden was he wanted to come and have a public hearing. Well, now we have a venue for a public hearing, and, and he's declining to come. The media attacked me for, for weeks because we wouldn't allow him to testify in public. Well, now we are. Now the media, you know, what's the media going to do now? I think the American people have a lot of questions. When you're investigating a family for this level of public corruption, we deserve the truth. The American people deserve the truth. And now I thought that was pretty rich. Hunter Biden's attorney called him showing up for a public hearing, an invitation to this carnival show. They would know. <laughs> they showed up unannounced to a hearing in the House and turned it into Cirque du Soleil. Who's the ringleader, right? I mean, we've got uh, Hunter Biden demanding this public uh, appearance before Congress. Uh, he doesn't get it initially, and now he's offered it, and he doesn't want it. I think it signals that his attorneys are uh, afraid of what he might say, afraid of his mm. need to take the fifth in public, in front of the cameras. That would be terrible, I think, for his dad. So uh, I think that it's got to be. that His attorneys so, must see a problem. So you didn't buy it when his attorneys, and when Democrats came out of the the hearing room uh, most recently after being behind closed doors with Hunter Biden. Everybody has a little bit of chat, wait for the transcript, that sort of thing. But initially what Democrats are saying is, oh, every question's been asked. He said everything. He said everything. Why didn't they just say that here? Why is it a conflict of, of schedule? If you feel like you've said it all, but no, what you're saying is they're afraid that he might say something else. Yes. 
I think when you listen to Democrats with their talking point that there is no evidence uh, regarding the impeachment proceedings and the allegations uh, regarding Hunter Bi Biden and his father, mm -hmm. uh, they're just repeating some sort of, uh, that it's just a line. Because there's plenty of circumstantial evidence to build a case here that Hunter Biden was directly connected to his dad. And Congress has important questions to ask on that very point. And now he's obviously doing this because he's scared about what might happen to him or to his father. I mean, there's no other reason than to not show up after asking to have this proceeding in the first yeah. place. Circumstantial gets such a bad rap because I would imagine in all of that, you're also talking about the very hard evidence of phone calls and text messages and all of that. Well, it's kind of a, a fool's game to try to define what circumstantial versus direct evidence is when some of that uh, converges on itself. The, I've prosecuted many cases. I've defended hundreds of cases that are built on circumstantial evidence, mm. and it doesn't always go the way the defendant would like it to go. Next time you come back, I want to talk Robert Herr and whether or not you would have charged Joe Biden. That's a tease. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Herr. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilmeade. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.